The idea of this um, live coding session is uh, to show you a few of the features of, of Crystal, of the Crystal language, maybe uh, look into uh, how we can require some of the packages, how we can browse the documentation, and how we can leverage some of the concurrency primitives on uh, of that the language has to offer. And to do so, I thought it would be nice to start from a very simple terminal-based tool um, that we can use to check the status of our uh, of our URLs or of a set of URLs. So, so what we'll do is um, we'll uh, spend some time uh, some time looking at how we initialize a Crystal application and check how we make very very simple HTTP calls. Then we'll look at how we can read from config files, and then we will check how we can concurrently check URLs with uh, channels and fibers, which are uh, the main concurrency mechanism in, in Crystal, even though others are also available. I will assume that you're um, familiar with at least one scripting language, uh, like Ruby or Perl or Python, and that you, you've done some coding in the past, even, even very, very basic stuff. Uh, but I won't spend too much time uh, introducing every every single thing so but feel free to um, ask questions in the in the chat anytime so without further ado um, I think we can start and so the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to initialize a project in, in Crystal uh, and in order to do so I'm just going to show you which version of Crystal I'm running which is 0.31.1 and I don't know if you've ever done this before, but you can initialize a project with Crystal in it. Uh, you can see that there's um, two different ways of initializing a project. You can initialize a library or an app. In our case, we want to initialize an app. So we're just going to go with Crystal init app. And then the command is expecting a project name. We're just going to go for URL checker. That should be all right. And now if I ls, you can see we get a URL checker right there. And the project initializer is quite nice because it also initializes the uh, project as a git project with, with a git ignore and all of that. So that's pretty handy. Uh, we can also just commit our first commit just to make sure we know where we started. Uh, and first git add first and that's it okay so now we have clean slate we're ready to go uh, and before we start uh, let's just go there and open the project with visual code we can just go url checker okay before we start i'm just gonna spend a few seconds on the on the folder structure. You will notice there is a spec folder where your tests are. Uh, ideally, if we have time today, we, we might even write one or two, but it will depend really on the on how things go and uh, what you find most, most useful. And then under the uh, source folder, uh, we have the definition of a module. For our purposes, we're gonna just start from a clean slate here. And the other file I wanted to mention is the shard YAML file. Uh, this is pretty important because this is where you define metadata about your project, in particular the pro project version, for example, but also, as we'll see later, some of the dependencies of the project will also go in here. So that's why it's good to know where, where dependencies go, uh, obviously. So I'm just going to go back to URL checker. Uh, and another thing I wanted to do before we start is I'll just make sure I have a terminal here. Right, and also, yeah, and also I want to make sure if I say goodbye, I want to make sure that I can run comments very quickly. And to do so, I'm just gonna uh, initialize a new task.json file. This is a pretty handy way to run commands anytime you want. So I'm just gonna say crystal run and then 
uh, use the special syntax for uh, just running whatever command we whatever file we're on so if I now go um, command shift B we should now be able to just run this there we go so just press command shift B and if we just give it a second in the panel below we should see goodbye very very soon almost there we go okay uh, I guess my my laptop is struggling a bit but it should be all right so we can get going then so the first thing we'd like to do because we are dealing with a URL checker is it would be good to understand how we uh, can actually uh, make HTTP, HTTP calls so I have conveniently opened the crystal lang API uh, reference manual and which is a very handy way of uh, exploring what is built in in uh, in crystal so I'm just going to look for HTTP and you can see the HTTP module comes up uh, and we also we want a an HTTP client in this case uh, we've done this mistake before we just want to look at the documentation rather than the source code but the source code is also available first thing we need to do is we need to require the package so I'm just going to do it here. So we require HTTP client, and then this is how we actually issue a request. Uh, I'm just going to say this is response, HTTP client get, and then we can go for Google just to do something everyone uh, know. And if I just uh, inspect the response, uh, nothing too exciting. We're just going to uh, produce a response object um, which we can explore in a second but I wanted to show you how easy it is to actually look at the at the content so there's quite a lot when you when you just uh, print the entire object if I just go for uh, response.body as you can see here we will actually look at the um, at the um, HTML that gets returned on the call. There we go. Which is quite quite intense because there's quite a lot of JavaScript in there uh, since last time I checked. But but actually, what we actually care about today is the status, and the status is going to be another another kind of object. Uh, so status code is actually an integer, which is what we want. Status is a bit of a more complex object where uh, we have OK in this case, which is our 200. If we want the status code, we're just going to go for status code. Let's see where we get. So we now know how we can make an HTTP call. So extending that to a, a list of URLs shouldn't be a problem. Here we go. So 200 is the, the status code we received back from google.com. Uh, but I'd like to now make things a bit more interesting and look at how we can read from a configuration file. And in order to do so, I'm just going to create a new file in the project. I'm just going to call it urls.yaml. And I'm going to populate it with urls and then a list of urls, HTTP. google.com and then we can add some HTTPS uh, amazon.co.uk for example and then maybe some localhost just gonna go HTTP localhost uh, port 3000 which at the moment is not there and then again another one that is probably not gonna return uh, anything is if I just go for non-existing 1312 please don't go and register this domain now just to make me look bad but I assume that this, this is a non-existing URL and so this is a YAML file I hope you're familiar with the format it's now all over the place the shard YAML is also in a YAML format uh, we are lucky enough that uh, the built-in functionality in Crystal also include uh, a YAML module. So we're going to look at what that has to offer. Um, so we, you can see we can just require 
the YAML package and then we can either open the file and parse the content of the file but there's also a shortcut to that um, because YAML parse can also take string we can just go with something like I'm just gonna comment this out for a second I'm gonna require YAML and then we can actually read our configuration file um, so we do yaml.parse and then we're going to do file.read which returns all the lines in the in the file really and the file is called url.urls.yaml and mind that you, here it's important that I'd be tempted to say dot slash because um, sorry dot uh, yeah uh, dot dot slash because the URL's YAML is uh, located one folder up from URL checker but actually what matters here is um, which folder we're running the crystal uh, interpreter well um, the crystal compiler and runner uh, from and in this case uh, because we're running the crystal uh, command from the main folder we actually want uh, file read dot slash URL dot YAML and if we do that then and then inspect the object. Let's see what we see. There we go. This makes more sense. Now, mind that this, if I go and inspect the class of this object, this is a dictionary, I think, uh, that goes from strings to uh, YAML any object there we go uh, so really so this uh, this is actually a YAML any so what we can do is looking at the instructions on the on the documentation we know that we can access uh, fields uh, as a as we would do in a with a hash but also mind that we actually have to so we will go URLs but then this object is still a YAML dot any uh, a YAML any so we need to be a bit careful when when we work with this uh, object we just need to uh, convert that to cast that to a an array in this case and and there's a, a convenient convenience method method to to do that which is as a and then if we inspect the class here I'm just gonna go a new line here if we, if we inspect the class Right, I forgot to remove this one. You will see it's an array of YAML any. So we need to do yet another uh, transformation here. So array of YAML any, which is great. So what I'll do is uh, uh, I'll map and then pass in dot as string. There are more sophisticated ways of uh, parsing YAML where you can just define the schema of the file you're reading and that makes it a bit more uh, intuitive what's going on uh, but but for the purpose of this uh, exercise we're just going to go for the bare minimum uh, that we can do to read to read our file so we have something that works uh, this is actually an array of strings which is what we wanted so you can see how we would probably say something like urls equals uh, yaml.parse uh, file read uh, and so on I can just make it a bit more readable uh, file lines and then say file lines equals this and we can probably also make this a proc just to make it a bit easier for us to read what's going on so get urls uh, is going to be a proc that reads from the file then parses the yaml and returns uh, the array of um, of strings. I think that's it. And now if we try and print get urls.call we should see what we expect. There we go. A list of strings which is what we wanted. So we know how to read from from a file now. We know how to parse a YAML file. So that's great. Let's go back to our uh, uh, instructions and go for 
uh, the actual interesting bit of the exercise. So now we can read from the from the URLs. I'm sure you can also see how we can uh, now go and fetch the URL, uh, fetch the status of the the status code for for each one of these URLs. So let's make our life a bit easier. Uh, we know that uh, HTTP get and then the URL will return the response object, and then we can just inspect the status code. So let's do ourselves a favor and say and define a get status code get status function that takes in a URL and then calls does a get on it and then assigns that to a response and then returns a response dot status code now just just to give it a go if I do um, get urls dot call dot first that that returns the google uh, the google url and if i now do get status dot call of this thing uh, i'd expect to see just to make it a bit more readable like this we know what to expect we'd expect to see a 200 or something oh uh, this is very interesting actually um uh, kind of did it on purpose so when you define a proc you have to make sure you also define the type of the um, arguments, otherwise the Crystal compiler is going to complain. So that, that's fine. URL is a string in this case. So we just make sure we declare the type of the string. And so far, if you look at what we've been writing, if you come from Ruby, most of what we've been writing looks very similar to what you know already. And this is probably the, the first moment where we actually diverge from the regular syntax you're used to. So we're just specifying a type. Um, we're specifying a type for uh, for the uh, parameter. Right, so we know how to get the status, so we'll do something a bit more exotic now. So we go uh, get urls.call. Uh, we see we have a 301, which is what we expected. And then, well, yeah, we've seen it used to be a 200. Uh, we might have fudged the, the URL a bit. And now if we do uh, get urls.call and then we map this is a list of, so let's make it a bit more explicit. This is a list of an array of strings. And then we call map, and we call map, and we say ampersand get status, which will call the function get status on each one of the URLs. Now, I know what's going to happen, but you can tell me what's going to happen now, uh, maybe. What, what is your expectation for this, uh, for this um, run? Uh, unfortunately, we'll have to fix a few issues here. So something bad happened while we were trying to fetch the status for localhost 3000. This is because the connection was refused, which is not unexpected. I'm not running anything on that port on my, on my computer right now. So this sounds like this get status actually forces us to deal with some um, exception uh, in in the case where HTTP get actually uh, explodes in a, in a bad way. So we're just going to wrap the the get call in uh, into a begin rescue block so that we can recover from recover from this sort of errors. Right, so we're going to say. Whenever you get an error A, uh, an error E, and also now that we are forced to think about what we want to return uh, when there's an error, maybe we can think about it. And one way, one thing we can do, which which will play well with uh, with our purposes here, is rather than returning just the status code, which kind of completely loses the uh, information about the URL, we actually return a tuple including the URL and the status code. And this also makes it a bit easier to see what's going to happen when there's an error. We're just going to return the URL and the error itself. We might want to wrap it into some other sort of custom error, but for now we're just going to be happy with that. Um, we're going to try and run this again. And uh, unsurprisingly, really, unless someone actually uh, registered the domain we we specified on the last row of our YAML. Non-existing 1312 is actually not a thing, and so we actually get a socket address info error. 
and this is a great opportunity to explore another interesting functionality of Crystal, which is the fact that uh, Crystal supports union types, which means we can actually say that we want to rescue from any error that is our, of type error no or socket addressing for error. And if we do so and run the application again, at this point I would expect uh, everything will be all right. So let's see how it goes. Okay, so this is actually pretty good. We have google.com returning 301. We have amazon.co.uk returning 301. And then we have a couple of URLs that are actually failing uh, when we try to get. One gives us connection refused. The other one, uh, no address found. But yeah, we're very, very close to where we want to be, I'd say. And this only took 15 lines of code. So that's pretty good, I would say. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll try and see, because I promised you we would work on a concurrent application, uh, I'm just going to show you that what we're doing right now is not running concurrently. So we're just going to say, uh, add some debugging lines here, saying calling URL before we call the URL, and then we're going to have another one. And because I want to print even, for the, even if there's an error, I'm just going to say ensure. So whatever we put in the ensure block will run no matter if there is an error that gets rescued or not. And we're just going to say called URL. Right, and I'm also going to try and make this maybe a bit better. So I can just say dot join. I've not tried it before, so hopefully this will work. Uh, let's see if this prints something a bit better. And we'll spend time looking at our debugging lines just to make sure that the HTTP calls actually happen sequentially, which is a bit limiting if you want. Okay, so first of all, uh, and of course this is a P rather than a puts, so of course it's going to look a bit weird. Uh, but let's focus on the debugging lines. So we have calling Google, called Google, then calling Amazon, then called Amazon. Same thing for localhost, same thing for non existing. Um, one three one two. So here you can see how we do one call at a time. Whereas what we actually want is we want to parallelize the process, or at least make it run concurrently. And this means we'd like to see things happening at the same time, or like looking as uh, if we don't have to wait for the response to come from Google uh, in order to go and and ping Amazon. So in order to do so, we need to work with fibers and channels. Um, I've talked about fibers and channel in a local meetup a few a few weeks ago, so I'm just gonna maybe post the, the link to that video uh, at the end of this uh, live streaming. Uh, but in the meantime, let's just, just bear with me. So the idea here we have is we have, we define a channel as a communication channel between different threads, you can think, and then threads are gonna be communicating across uh, channels by passing messages to one another without sharing any state. And the reason why we're doing this is um, we're just thinking about a design where we have a producer, let's say URL generator, which sends a message into a channel and the message it puts into the channel is a URL. And then on the other side, there is a worker let's say worker zero, that actually reads that URL and spits it into another channel. And what it produces is the uh, tuple with the URL and the result of the call. Right, but we want to make this a bit more exciting. So actually what we're gonna do is we're gonna do URL generator and then rather than only having one worker reading from this from these channel, we're gonna have two. So there's gonna be another one here and this is gonna be worker number one, and this is also going to return into the same, to publish into the same channel. My ASCII foo is not amazing, but yeah, you can see what's going on here, right? And of course we could have another one just underneath, we could have a worker too, but, but just to keep it simple, we will have only two workers. And each one of them is gonna publish into this one uh, channel, and we can then say, and then there's gonna be something like printing the output, okay, just a printer that prints the output to, to the terminal. Okay, 
now that we know what we're doing uh, hopefully uh, we can go and give it a go so we will need a couple of, of channels and we will need a generator the generator will be actually on the main on the main channel whereas well maybe maybe not we'll see and then we define a channel that is URL stream we're gonna call it you will hear these naming sort of naming quite a lot when you talk about channels even though they're not always behaving like a stream but they well at least uh, it's a good way of thinking about them so we're going to define a channel where we put strings this is a type parameter so we initialize a url stream and then we can define we can just say get urls dot call and then for each one of these we're going to publish it into the URL stream. So we're just going to do URL stream dot send URL. Okay. Right. I'm just going to forget about this for a second. So what we're doing here here is we are taking care of this part where we're going for the URL generator and publishing into a URL uh, channel. And then on the other side, we actually want a couple of workers to read this, right? So we're just going to do it in a pretty compact way we're just gonna say two times sorry wrong file uh, for two times uh, spawn a new fiber or a new thread and just look at the URL stream receive something for the from the URL stream so this is gonna return a string so that's our URL and then with the URL do a get status call of the URL. This is going to return a tuple. So this is our result tuple. And then we're going to do a bit of a, let's just say result, make life a bit simpler. And then we're going to publish the result to another channel, which is going to be, well, what can we call it? We can call it the result channel, result stream is the output of our um, HTTP calls and the type of the objects we put in this stream is a string and then a I'll let's to check actually uh, that will be probably an integer we can actually check here if we go back to the documentation for HTTP uh, status code seems to be an integer let's see yeah it should be an integer someone on the stream wants to help with that uh, I can probably go to response let's do that just for the sake of exploring the documentation a bit so response we actually want client response there we go and if I go status code that's an integer 32 good to know right so if we go back this is int 32. The compiler is going to tell us if we're doing something wrong anyway, but I just want to make sure that we know what we're doing. So result stream dot send result is going to be what we do to send the result in, right? Right. So at this point, the only thing we're missing is a printer, which is going to do more or less what we were doing before, just printing things. So for the time being, I'm, I'm being a bit naive here. So I'm just going to do result stream dot receive. And this is going to be a result object. And I'm just going to be doing, uh, I'm just going to be printing that. And we know that we have to do that for a while, right? So I'm just going to say do, do, do it a few times. like forever, and then we'll just uh, block uh, the application. There we go, Sandy's complaining, look, uh, we're looking for a tuple, where are we, line 32, result stream send result, undefined method send for channel tuple string in 32. Hmm. So get status will return D 
the object, I think. But I'm probably missing something. Let's do a bit of debugging. Right. So we're reading a URL from the stream. That's a string. Then we do get status call. Let's just print. Hmm. And then result stream send result. Just trying to figure out what's the matter here. No method send for class. Okay, so result stream. Oh, we forgot to call new here. Oh man, so bad. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Good kind of uh, good kind of problems we have. And now we just need to make sure. So no overload matches. Oh, this is pretty good. So the compiler is informing us that uh, the channel where we declare results as a uh, tuple of string and in 32, that's unfair, but ac because actually it can be in 32 or an exception, which is actually a very good point. So thanks compiler. And as you can see, uh, not surprisingly, uh, not too surprisingly, uh, things are getting stuck. So we don't see a goodbye here, right? And I just wanted to spend a moment thinking about what's going on here. So we have these get URLs, we call it, so we get all the URLs, and then for each one of them, we send into the URL stream. Now, the thing we need to remember is that channels are actually blocking when we call send on them. Um, so what this means is that the main, the main fiber actually blocks at this point and we will never run the code that comes after that. So what we need to do if we actually want to see this working is we need to spawn a new fiber that we'll be able to just wait until someone reads the values from the channel. And that should just do it. And of course, as you can see here, we're blocked. So when I do, when I build again, it goes like, hey, do you want to actually terminate this process? And the answer is yes because uh, that was was stuck. So let's see how things go now. Okay, we're calling the right stuff and I can see we're also printing the right stuff. And I can also tell you that I know why we only called uh, the get for Google and Amazon. If we go back, what we're doing here two times is we spawn a process, a new, a new fiber. It will go and take a URL, get the status, publish it to the result stream, but then that's it. So this only happens twice, right? So you will see this pattern coming on, uh, coming up often. You actually often see this spawn do and then loop do. And this is because you're basically defining a server that runs in a separate fiber that will just loop through some operations. So this time, we don't just stop there after we send the value, but as soon as the value has been read on the other side of the stream, we just go and pick another value from uh, the URL stream. So again, we're gonna restart. And hopefully we're gonna see an, an interesting interleaving of uh, debugging messages from get status. So if I go up here, we can see that we're actually calling Google, then calling Amazon before we wait for Google to come back to us. At this point, we are done with Google. We go into calling localhost. That gets resolved super quickly because it's a failure. Same thing for the non-existing URL. At that point, we get a response for from Amazon as well. And there we go. So we do have it. We have a concurrent system, that a concurrent application that goes with two workers and checks uh, two URLs at a time and uh, returns all the responses in a very thread safe way, uh, pushes them into a result stream. A printer gathers all the results from the result stream and just publish them all on the output. And that's very nice. So if we just do some cleanup now, I'm just gonna remove these puts and just remove the uh, just going to remove the, the debugging code just to see now that we know that things are happening in, in, in a concurrent fashion. Uh, and then we're just going to focus on the output for a second. And Because the last thing I wanted to touch on uh, today, really, because we have a bit more time, is we're just going to import a dependency and try to print these uh, results in a bit of a nicer way. 
Um, but please, if you have any comment or questions so far, uh, feel free to drop them into the, the stream chat. I'd be happy to look into those. And if there's no questions, so I think maybe one thing we can do before we go on is um, rather than just printing the results, we can start maybe aggregating some statistics about, um, about the responses we get from the different URLs. So what we'll do is inside this um, loop is, or just outside if you wish, we're just going to define a hash. It's going to be something like, let's say a success hash, which is going to be, or maybe we can just do something a bit results or maybe stats object. And this is going to be a, a hash that has a URL as a key and actually a tuple as a value or maybe a name tuple. Why not? And it's going to be success, which is an integer and then failure, which is another integer. So let's see where we, where we go with this. So when we receive a new value, this is going to be a result object. When we receive a new value, what we do is we take the result and take the first element, which is the URL. Actually, we can do this, which is a shorthand for extracting the values from the, um, from the tuple we have on the right-hand side. Um, now, we're going to capture the URL and the result. The URL is a string. The result might be an exception or a status code. Either way, what we do here is we take the stats object, uh, access the URL, and maybe just mm, decide what to do with it. So we can say if uh, we can actually do something a bit nicer. We can say case result. <clears throat> and say when result is an integer, then increment uh, increment the success when result is a failure, so an exception, then increment something else, increment the failure value. So what we do is increment dot success. Uh, what are we going to be doing? So this is going to be something like, this is the current value, current value for the particular URL. And we're going to do something like current value equals Sorry, I'm just getting a bit lost. We're going to assign again to stats URL and say it's going to be a tuple where we have success, which is current value dot success. Sorry. Can I access a tuple with the dot notation? I don't think so. Let's try anyway. Plus one. And then failure is just going to be the same. Okay, and we'll do the same thing. Just going to go to new line. Let's see if the compiler is happy to parse this like this. And then we're going to do the same for failures. If it is an exception, then we increment the failures. Okay, I'm expecting some uh, some compilation error, but that's fine. And then, so once we do this, rather than printing the, we actually just print the entire stat, the, the stats object as is. So that's going to be interesting. Um, right, where are we? Current value, it's not have. Oh, yeah, sorry. This is failure. Right? Better? 
and then undefined method access for hash string hmm We also forgot the dot new up here, so this is a class rather than an object. Let's try again. Getting there. Looks like the compiler is happy this time. Let's see if we can get something good out of this. Right. Oh, that's great. So, as you can as you can see. Uh, we're getting a miss, missing a hash key, so this is a, a, a runtime error where we go access the stats object with google.com, but there's no such a thing in the in the hash, so we just get an explosion, uh, an exception here. So what we can do is we can go back to the uh, documentation, look for hash, and see how we can define default values for a hash, which is pretty convenient in this case, because we know what we want. We just want to define okay so we can just pass the default value as the first argument in our uh, in our constructor so we're just gonna change this a bit and say new and just say give it a tuple success zero failure zero so in a case where the key is not there uh, the hash is just gonna return when we try to access a key it's just gonna return these default object which has success set to zero and failure set to zero okay this is getting better i must say so every time we receive a new a response we just update uh, their um, the counting the, the, the statistics with a failure or a success and if you're if you've been paying attention and you remember we were talking about uh, working on a status checker you know that it's not fair that we're just saying that everything is a success if it is a uh, if the status is uh, a number so actually here we probably want something a bit more sophisticated we want something like if resolved um, so let's say we will probably want to say something like if resolved is less than 400 uh, then increment the success else go and increment the failure which is more or less this there's going to be there's going to be a lot of duplication here but that's actually okay for our purposes right now so if we look at this again a 400 uh, will actually be considered as a failure so we'll get uh, we'll count it as a failure rather than a success And everything is working fine okay so one last thing before we go we have 15 minutes and then we have to go to bed is rather than printing stats like this let's try to print in a tabular fashion now there's a very nice let me just switch to another view so that you can see the documentation a bit better if I go to this nice awesome crystal um, uh, github project uh, you can see there's plenty of Git of uh, crystal projects that you can uh, and libraries that you can use straight away. If I go for table, there's a very nice um, terminal table generator which is called Tableau that I've used uh, in the past. And so what we'll do is we'll just add a dependency on this Tableau thing and then see how that works. So we'll just take the opportunity to update our shard YAML with some dependencies. And anytime you update your dependencies in the project, remember to run shards install in the main directory. Okay, now we can rely on Tableau. We can also look at the project and see how that works. So the first step is to require Tableau, which is fair enough. And then we can actually print things in a bit of a nicer way. So the idea is we need to present the data in this format, which is a list of lists, if you, if you notice. So it's an array of arrays. And once we do that, we can then uh, use this syntax to add columns, uh, columns and, um, uh, and uh, set them up. So let's try and do that. So the first thing we need to do 
is once we have our statistics, we need to shape, like to reshape the statistics of, as an array of arrays. So what we're doing here is we are reshaping the data, making it so that we have an array of arrays. And then once we do, we just build a table and put stable at the end. That's really it. Okay. Well, thanks for watching. This is a bit of an experiment. Any feedback you have, any comments, anything you'd like to see uh, done in Crystal, please let me know. And I'll be happy to um, give it a go.